Hello everyone and welcome, or fellow Tropers, welcome to another episode of Tropecast. We're now on to episode 29 and we're doing prequel tropes. And the category I'm choosing to look over for this would be... Live action films. So here we go. The Godfather Part 2 is at once a prequel and a sequel to the original film. Jumping back and forth between the young Vito at the turn of the century and Michael in the nineteen in the 50s. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is a prequel to the first film. As well, there there was a TV series, The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, Star Wars. The entire prequel trilogy provides the backstory for Anakin Skywalker, uh, Anakin Skywalker's turn to the dark side, and the formation of the Galactic Empire. Some viewers objected to the way the series has Anakin interact with characters he does not seem to recognize later in the original trilogy. The expanded universe attempts to retcon some of the discrepancies away. This despite the fact that Anakin slash Vader was in the same scene in both trilogies with only a handful of characters to wit Palpatine, Obi-Wan, Boba Fett, using a very generous definition of with, Tarkin and C-3PO. In each case, except the last, he does, he does recognise them with, C3, with C-3PO. Well, when they meet in Empire Strikes Back, Vader was kind of preoccupied. The prequel trilogy's films also have a far more advanced galaxy than the original trilogy. Despite it being over two decades earlier, justified to an extent, as most of the original trilogy takes place in the galactic boondocks or on naval ships, well, the prequels are set in the main part of the galaxy, OTH. George Lucas says that was deliberate as the prequels were more civ- were a more civilized age. Rogue One is another prequel to of, of a new hope ending very shortly possibly minutes before the first movie kicks off. Cruel Intentions 2 is a prequel to Cruel Intentions. The Sui Hark movie, A Better Tomorrow 3, was the prequel to the two John Woo movies that would kick off the heroic bloodshed genre. It follows Chow Yun-Fat's Mark Gore as he goes to Saigon, falls in love and develops into the gunslinging badass that we know him from, A Better Tomorrow, and no... He does not keep the girl. Yui Bowles House of the Dead is actually a prequel to the video games. Its canonicity is disputable. Likewise with the first two Blood Rains. More Rats is set the day before the events in Clerks. The Scorpion King is supposed to be the prequel to The Mummy Returns. Although the fact that there is nothing to indicate that Matthias will turn evil appears to break that connection. However, word of God is that the Scorpion King featured in The Mummy Returns is actually Matthias's identical grandson. It is, possible, it is probably more of a spin-off than a true prequel. The director video film The Scorpion King 2 Rise of a Warrior is a prequel to The Scorpion King. 
making it a prequel to a prequel. Paranormal Activity 2 is mostly a prequel to the first film. Its follow-up, Paranormal Activity 3, is a prequel to the second film. Final Destination 5 isn't explicitly advertised as such, instead opting for a twist ending in which... Spoiler alert. It turns out it is a prequel. However... Some of the trailers spoiled this by showing new footage of blank. The Thing 2011 is set less than a week before the first movie. It shows how the monster was first discovered and what it did to the Norwegian base. Although the films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe are standalone for the most part, their internal chronology makes Captain America the first Avenger and Captain Marvel prequels, as they take place entirely before the events of Iron Man. Most people would be surprised if you pointed out that the Muppet movie was actually a prequel to the Muppet show, unless they've actually seen them. Of course, since it's blindingly obvious that many of the various characters who are friends, or at least co-workers of long-standing on the show are meeting for the first time in the movie. Both X-Men Origins Wolverine and X-Men First Class serve as prequels to the original X-Men film series trilogy. X-Men Days of Future Past, meanwhile, is an odd example in that it is both a prequel and a sequel to the original trilogy, concluding with a blank. This means its sequel, X-Men Apocalypse, is still taking place year but years before the original trilogy isn't a prequel anymore. If one wants to nitpick very much, it is still technically a prequel since the ending of Days Blank. Rise of the Planet of the Apes to the Planet of the Apes film series, more like a continuity reboot. The third, fourth and fifth films of the original series were prequels to the first two. However, the third qualifies as both a prequel and, from the verses, from the verses point of view, and a sequel from that of the ape characters. Terminator Salvation is a bit of an oddball because of the series' heavy use of time travel in both It is both a sequel to Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines and a prequel to the events of the original The Terminator. Prometheus is described as a semi-prequel to the Alien series. Alien vs Predator and Aliens vs Predator Requiem were also prequels to Alien. But in the wake of this new film, there can on it difficult to determine Red Dragon is a prequel to The Silence of the Lambs. The novel had already been adapted into film as Manhunter, but the original version did not fit into the film series, with Anthony Hopkins as Lecter. The same goes for Hannibal Rising. Dumb and Dumber when Harry Met Lloyd is a prequel to Dumb and Dumber. Both Exorcist The Beginning and Dominion prequel to The Exorcist exactly what it says on the tin, prequels to the original film in two different perspectives of the directors. The former is the result of a complex executive meddling for the latter. Tremors 4 The Legend Begins is the fourth and final film in the Tremors series and a prequel to the earlier movies. But there are six Tremors films. The Hobbit trilogy is set before the Lord of the Rings trilogy. This doesn't apply to the books though, Lord of the Rings was a proper sequel. There is no word of God and it wasn't marketed as such. But the good, the bad and the ugly, the last movie of the Dollars trilogy is a prequel to the other two. It takes place during the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865 while a gravestone dated 1873 is clearly seen in the first movie, A Fistful of Dollars. 
Blondie also gains the iconic clothes he wears in the two other movies during the last third of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Cube Zero is a prequel to the original Cube. The main character suffers the same fate as Blank from the original, but since they couldn't get the original actor, they're only vaguely implied to be the same person. The continuity in this series is already marginal at best due to having different creators for each entry who all had different ideas on what the mythology should be. Ginger Snaps Back The Beginning is a distant prequel to the first Ginger Snaps featuring the apparent ancestors of the Fitzgerald sisters encountering a werewolf in a completely different time period. The Western Nevada Smith is a prequel to The Carpetbaggers, a film about the movie industry. Underworld Rise of the Lycans is a prequel to the Underworld series. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is envisioned as a five film original prequel series to the Harry Potter series, both books and films at first exploring the titular Fantastic Beasts, but later putting more focus to the campaign against the series' predecessor villain, Gellert Grindelwald. The first is set in 1926, 65 years before Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, while the second, The Crimes of Grindelwald, is set nine months afterward in 1927. Subsequent films are expected to take place between the year... 1927 and 1945, the year of Grindelwald's defeat. Insidious Chapter 3 is set before the events of the first film, showing how Elise Spex and Tucker were showing what Elise Spe- Elise Spex and Tucker were up to before they became involved with the Lamberts, the Conjuring series. Annabelle is set a year before the titular doll is retrieved by the Warrens in the opening scene of The Conjuring. As the title suggests, Annabelle creation shows how the doll came to be and thus predates the previous three films by having a 1955 setting. The first Annabelle is set in 1970. No, it's not. It's set in 1967. The Nun is set in 1952, the earliest time period of the series, predating all the previous films released. The indicated, as indicated in the title, Ouija Origins of Evil, details the start of darkness for the main villains of Ouija, with a setting some 50 years prior. As the events of Wonder Woman 2017 happened before and in the same universe as Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, then is a prequel of both, though more directly connected to the latter. Smoking Aces 2 Assassin's Ball takes place prior to Smoking Aces. This doesn't show too much since the plots are mostly unrelated, except for featuring some recurring characters such as Laszlo Zoot and the Tremor family, at least one of whom was killed in the first movie. The original Japanese adaptation of The Ring has a prequel in Ring Zero Birthday, an Origins episode set 30 years prior. The prequel is adapted from a short story of an omnibus novel that, among other things, includes a plain sequel and an interquel. Death Race 2, Frankenstein Lives and Death Race 3, Inferno, despite being numbered sequels, are both prequels to the Death Race remake. And that, guys, is all we have time for in this episode. So, before I go... I'm just going to tell you that the next category I'm going to look at in these episodes is 
going to be... Is um yes, it's going to be a sequ the sequel gap. Until then I thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to episode thirty of Tropecast. We're now on the sequel first trope. No, we're not. We're on the sequel gap trope, sorry. And I've chosen to do Western animation for this one, so here we go. Spoilers ahead. The Boondocks was infamous for having increasingly longer gaps in between seasons. One year and seven months passed between season one, 2005 to 2006, and season two, 2007 to 2008. Then season three, 2010, came only two year came out two years later. Season four, 2014, was released nearly four years later. After the show was apparently cancelled, it was eventually announced that it would be revived in the form of a reboot series that would premiere sometime in 2020, over six years after the last season of the original series. Masters of the Universe. As far as strictly animation series goes, there's a five year gap between the end of the original series, ended 1985, and the new Avengers of He-Man 1990, which doesn't even reach a full five years if one counts She-Ra, Princess of Power, ended 1986. Counting other adaptations, the gap is otherwise filled with live action, with a live action Masters of the Universe 1987. The New Adventures of He-Man and he to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe 2002, 12 years. The 2002 series to She-Ra Princess of Power, sorry, Prin and she She-Ra and the Princesses of Power 2018, 16 years. Voltron. Defender of the Universe to Voltron the Third Dimension, 1998, 12 years. The Third Dimension to Voltron Force, 2011, 13 years. Force to Voltron Legacy De Legendary Defender, 2016, only 5 years. Young Justice was also cancelled in 2013 after 2 seasons but was revived for a third season in 2019 as well, six years later. Star Wars The Clone Wars was cancelled in 2013 after, with its sixth season being released on Netflix, DVD and syndication in 2014. His seventh season, announced in 2018, was released on Disney Plus beginning February 21st, 2020. Nearly six years after the sixth season, a six year period in which sequel series Rebels completed its four season run. Resistance had just completed its two season run and the entire sequel trilogy was released. Samurai Jack, the fourth season ended in 2004. The fifth and final season would be wouldn't be produced until 2017, making a 12 and a half year wait in the meantime. This may have been part due in part due to the creator spending the most of the time desiring to produce the final arc of the show as a theatrical film before deciding that ending it on a television on television would be a better route as the creator jumped between multiple T V and film projects with the hope of eventually doing that final season as a movie. 
if you take the non-canon IDW comic book series that ran from 2013 to 2015 into account, you have a nine year age gap between new Samurai Jack stories. After the Nalvana produced the Care Bears series ended in 1988, the franchise went 16 years without an animated adaptation until 2004's Care Bears Journey to Jokerlot if their first animated series since 1988 is to be considered then it's 19 years with Care Bears Adventures in Carolot 2007 closing the gap the My Little Pony franchise had a gap without an animated television series that lasted 18 years between 1992's My Little Pony Tales and 2010's My Little Pony Friendship is Magic the toy line did exist as Generation 3 and Generation 3.5, 1997 to 1999, and 2003 to 2009 respectively. But the only animated works between these periods were director video films and shorts. And that would be the sequel gap trope. So next episode... may take a while to come also but when it does it will be time to look at examples for the trope I said it was at the beginning of the episode the sequel first trope and that will be next time. Until then, thanks for watching. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Tropecast. We're now on to episode 31. And the category I'm going to be taking you through today, or tonight more appropriately, is the sequel first category. And now, which examples category should I start with no okay a uh, film the North American release of the Jackie Chan film Armor of God 2 Operation Condor, retitled simply Operation Condor, came six years after its release in Hong Kong, before the original Armor of God, when the original finally made it across the Pacific, direct video no less. It was retitled Operation Condor 2 The Armor of Gods. Confused yet? Mad Max slash The, Wo the Road Warrior got a bigger worldwide release than the original Mad Max, which is why it's generally known as just the Road Warrior on some markets. The New Zealand release is especially noteworthy as number one was banned due to blank resembling an incident in the North Island. Lucio Fulci's Zombie 2 was titled as such to capitalise off the success of Zombie, which was actually the Italian recut of George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead, 1978, which was released in the US. It was retitled Zombie. Subsequent sequels weren't retitled, leaving many Americans wondering where the mythical second zombie film could be found. If that doesn't hurt the mind to begin with, the issue was corrected, 
in a two disc re-release of the original titled, you guessed it, Zombie 2, leaving a whole new generation of horror fans to wonder where the hell the first zombie picture could be found. The Italian cut, which removes humour, of Dawn of the Dead is out in America as zombie Dawn of the Dead. Whether this makes things more or less confusing is up for debate. In Italy, the Maniac Cop series <laughs> received the same treatment. Maniac Cop 2 became Poliziotto, Sadico, Sadist, Policeman. While the first movie was retitled as Maniac Cop, Poliziotto Sadiko 2 Film fans who pay attention to the credits must have wondered why the poster for Missing an Action has the credit based on the characters created by Arthur Silver and Larry Levinson and Steve Bing. The canon group film Missing an Action 2 the beginning first as Battle Rage but it was decided the actual sequel, in which Braddock, Chuck Norris, goes back to Vietnam, was the stronger of the two and hence Cannon released that first. The 4th and 11th of Clyde Custler's Dirk Pitt adventures raised the Titanic and Sahara 2005 received film adaptations first. Technically, The Da Vinci Code was a sequel to Angels and Demons, even going so far in the novels as Robert Langdon to refer to the heroine of Angels and Demons as last seeing her a year prior. When the films came out in the reverse order, the incontinuity is referred to the dialogue when the Vatican personnel are trying to get Langd Landon to help them. Why does it say Langdon up there and Landon down here? Hey you guys, call me! The film adaptations of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, not quite your typical example, as they're evidently not trying to pass off the events of the latter as happening after those in the former, but some people do seem to think that The Lord of the Rings books came out earlier. No, actually, they did not. The Vengeance trilogy was distributed like this in the US. The second part, Old Boy, 2003, opened first, followed by the first part, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, and then the third part, Sympathy for Lady Vengeance, which was renamed Lady Vengeance for its release. The most famous example is the Star Wars franchise, starting out with Episode 4, with episodes 1 to 3 and episodes 7 to 9, written and filmed decades after the fact. Though this is also somewhat retroactive, as A New Hope was simply labelled as Star Wars upon its first theatrical release, Drunken Master and Drunken Master 2 were both big successes in Hong Kong, but did not cross into Western markets after Jackie Chan became a star in the USA, Drunken Master 2 was released to American theatres under the title The Legend of Drunken Master to avoid confusing audiences. The Silence of the Lambs was based on Thomas Harris's, Thomas Harris's second Hannibal Lecter novel. The success of the film led to Harris writing a third novel, which was adapted into the second film, Hannibal, and then the third film, Red Dragon, was a prequel based on the original book. Confusing things further, the fourth film, Hannibal Rising, is also a prequel, but is based on the fourth book. Okay, uh, you want more, guys? Because I can give you more if you want it. How about literature? 
Peter Robinson's book series about the police detective Alan Bang so far numbers 18 titles. The Swedish translation starts only at book number 10, A Dry Season. Warrior Cats, the Lost Warrior manga trilogy, which involves events that don't happen until partway through the second series of books, was released in Germany before they finished translating the first series. Although Secrets of the Clans was the first book in the Field Guide spin-offs, it was released a few years after Code of the Clans, the third book of the spin-offs in, Ge in Germany. There are no known plans for translating the other five field guides into German. Neil Gaiman has referred to Stardust as book two of a trilogy that hasn't happened yet. In a new afterword to that novel, he claimed that book one is partially written and has, and has been since a few years before Stardust came out, and that he has a plot developed for, the, for book three. Some popular series of children's books were retroactively renumbered, leading to generational confusion about which book is first. The, Chroni the Chronicles of Narnia, for example, went by publication order. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The Silver Chair, were followed by The Horse and His Boy, overlapping the events of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, The Magician's Nephew, and the last battle. Later, the author, that would be C.S. Lewis, renumbered the series based on dramatic date in the order 6152347. Something similar has happened with the Red Wall series involving even more titles. Happened with the Italian release of some of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid side books. The Wimpy Kid movie diary, the next chapter was released before Double Down, as the next chapter is a behind the scenes for the fourth movie. It should have no issue except that early in the book, as a brief explanation of how scripts and storyboards work, we see Greg's script for Night of the Nightcrawlers 2, the sequel to the horror movie he and Rowley made in Double Down. Diary of an Awesome Friendly Kid, which makes a few references to the events that happened in the Meltdown, was released in Italy before the Meltdown. The Italian release of Dove Pilkey Dog Man began before they even ended the release of the Captain Underpants books. As a result, George and Harold's introduction in the first Dogman book spoils Yesterday George, and Yesterday Harold's POV ending of the Captain Underpants and the sensational saga of Sir Stinks a Lot to Italian readers. Yes, because we know that's what they're like. Okay. Do you want to go live action TV, guys? Because I can do it if you want me to. Or shall we stop for this episode? And instead, I tell you which category I'm going to cover next. And that will be... That of the
same plot sequel trope. Until then, I thank you for watching <clears throat> and goodbye. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Trope Cast. We're now on to the 32nd official episode. And it's about the same plot sequels trope. So, and that's basically a sequel with the same plot as the original. And this is common for many Disney Toon Studio sequels. In The Little Mermaid 2 Return to the Sea, Ariel's daughter Melody goes through pretty much the same plot as her mother in The Little Mermaid. Only with the land and the sea inverted this time. Teenage girl wants to live in the other element. Overprotective parent stops her from doing so. She rebels and makes a deal with a power hungry sea witch. Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas, is technically a miquel. It expands on the events that happened during the song Something There. In the original Beauty and the Beast, ultimately it tells exactly the same story. Belle is captured by the Beast, and they eventually soften up to each other and fall in love. Return to Neverland is a sequel to Peter Pan, and uses many of the same plot elements. A child, this time only one instead of three, ends up in Neverland, teams up with Peter Pan and gets pursued by Captain Hook. Hook is still pursued by a hungry beast this time. Except, for some reason, it's an octopus rather than a crocodile. The Jungle Book 2, the sequel to The Jungle Book, still revolves around the dilemma whether Mowgli belongs to the jungle or the man village, and Baloo still wants him to live in the jungle with him. Meanwhile, Shere Khan still pursues Mowgli to kill him. Finding Dory has many of the same story beats as Finding Nemo. In both films, the title character gets captured and put in an aquarium, while two other characters try to find them. There's an opening flashback, a school field trip, where things go wrong, a scene set on a shipwreck, a glow-in-the-dark predator, some predators who are friendly to the protagonists, a goofy bird, a gruff character who tries repeatedly to escape the aquarium, a reunion with lost parents, and a climax in which dozens of fish perform an unlikely escape. Incredibles 2 also has many of the same story beats as the original The Incredibles. One of the par parents is given the opportunity to relive their glory days as a superhero, while the other parent stays at home raising the kids. Yes, that is quite... Yep, okay. Live action films. Jurassic Park. This happened not once but twice after the series was revived. Jurassic World, taking place two decades after the original Jurassic Park, borrows many elements from it. Two children visit a park of genetically engineered dinosaurs run by a relative of theirs. Due to an error in the security system, dangerous dinosaurs escape and attack people, and the children get lost. Blank. Also, the general theme of human greed and interfering with nature is the same. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has been called essentially a remake of the Lost World Jurassic Park, with a heavy-handed, almost obnoxious green Aesop about an expedition being sent back to the dinosaur-filled islands after the original park broke down to retrieve as many specimens as possible, with a but while a bunch of smug snake corrupt corporate executives attempt to profit off it. The dinosaurs break free and cause a rampage on the mainland. 
leading to a karmic death for the cartoonish capitalist villains and an ending speech by one of the previous film's characters that people will have to learn to live with dinosaurs roaming the earth. The Force Awakens, the seventh installment in the Star Wars film series, has a similar plot to the original trilogy, particularly A New Hope, to the point that The Force Awakens comes off as a soft remake, an evil Nazi-esque army led by a sinister figure in black constructs a space weapon that can destroy planets. A resistance member hides some information the villains so want in the memory of a droid. Who gets stranded on a desert planet and found by an orphan with infinity to the force. They escape the villains and encounter an old mentor figure who fought in the previous war. Blank, they go to the villain's base. Blank. A lot of the same things also happen in the same order and around the same time as in A, as in a New Hope. The Hangover Part 2 was nearly a note-for-note -note copy of the original, with the gang getting together for another bachelor party, another drinking session, another morning hangover, another member of the party missing, Alan slipping the other's drugs again, another madcap quest to find the missing person. Home Alone 2 is basically the first Home Alone again, complete with traps, misunderstood loner with a heart of gold, and so on. Team Wolf 2 follows a cousin of the main character in Team Wolf, who is also a teen and also discovers that he is a werewolf. The only difference is that instead of using it to become an ace at basketball, he uses it to become an ace at boxing. Superman Returns Superman arrives from outer space, makes his debut saving Lois Lane from a falling aircraft. Spends his on patrol montage saving people and stopping petty crime, then tries to take on Lex Luthor only to be weakened by kryptonite, thrown in water and saved before drowning, fights to protect citizens from major disasters and earthquakes, then foils Luthor's plan by performing a ludicrously impossible feat in outer space. If it weren't for the subplot about a possible sun, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's just a remake of Superman. Escape from LA is essentially a remake of Escape from New York, almost plot point for plot point. Snake is captured and then enlisted by the authorities to break into a former city that is now a huge prison island, Manhattan and Los Angeles respectively, to retrieve an important person to prevent and prevent a war. Even characters are remarkably similar. Cuvro, or Curvo Jones is the Duke. Maps to the stars, Eddie is crabby, etc. Riddick creators David Toy and Vin Diesel expressed in interviews that they specifically wanted to avoid this when they made the Chronicles of Riddick by not simply doing a remake of Pitch Black only with bigger and meaner monsters. However, the sequel was then criticised for veering too far away from its premise and placing Riddick a knife-happy criminal in a Star Wars-esque space epic as the last hope of saving the universe from the thrall of an evil empire. The next movie, simply titled Riddick, then played this straight. Once again, Riddick is stranded on an uninhabited planet before nightfall arrives and the whole planet is swarmed with hostile aliens requiring the humans to retrieve energy batteries 
to power a ship and escape. Fright Night 2 New Blood is an odd case where it's officially a sequel to the 2011 movie, which was already a remake of the 1985 to the 1985 movie, but it's really just the same plot again, character names and all. Teenage boy suspects that his neighbour is a vampire, recruits a horror TV star to reluctantly help him. Blank, final battle where the vampire is killed by sunlight. The only real difference is that the vampire is a woman this time around, and is implied to be a historical figure like Dracula, namely Elizabeth Bathory, which makes you wonder why they didn't just make it a divorced instalment. Since a bunch of ragtag heroes fighting a vampirized Bathory has enough potential by itself. Actually subverted in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which sets itself up as being a same plot sequel to the Terminator, the machine sends the Terminator back in time to kill John Connor before he can become a resistance leader, and so Connor sends someone to protect his own past self. The film's first act contains many scenes that mirror the first, with the Terminator played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, and his mysterious opponent played by his... by... played... this time by Robert Patrick, making their way around in the present day and trying to find their quarry, the only difference being that now they're looking for John himself rather than his young mother. Then comes the shocking twist that reveals that blank, at which point the plot goes off in much a different direction than the first film. <sighs> Dear. Wild Things 2 is pretty much a carbon copy of the original Wild Things. Set in South Florida, two high school girls as the main characters, one a white trash tomboy and the other a feminine rich girl, a fraudulent court case that ends with somebody being awarded a lot of money, a threesome scene between the conspirators, then an ensuing gambit pile-up, while lots of other characters turning out to have been in on it all along. Then either ending up dead themselves in a series of backstabs, or revealed to have faked their deaths. There's even a montage of scenes over the ending credits to fill in the gaps in the plot. The Cutting Edge has three director video sequels. Each of those repeats the same basic formula. A professional ice skater needs a partner. He turns out to be someone from a different, less artistic sport. Hockey player, rollerblader, hockey player, speed skater. They become not only skating partners, but also fall for one another. There will be usually a romantic false lead, or miscommunication to add some drama, only for there to be declarations of love right before, or even during, the competition. Although in two of the four cases, the romance doesn't last to the sequel. Only the couple from the original movie stays together, even if played by different actors, while their daughter's marriage doesn't last, and the daughter's student's romance lasts only as long as her partner's skating career. We don't know anything about her second romance since there wasn't a fifth movie. In every movie but one, the professional skater is female, while the amateur is male. Pacific Rim Uprising follows the plot of Pacific Rim, pretty much beat for beat. The main character of each film is a disgraced former Jager plot pilot, 
who gets coaxed back into service and teamed up with a female rookie whose parents were killed by kaiju. Both films start with a replacement for the Jager program being proposed, only for a sudden disastrous attack to make the Jagers relevant again. I mean, that's Jagers, but you know. Both films, that should be films, have the majority of the Jaegers destroyed so that there's only four left to repel the biggest kaiju attack to date. Both films' climaxes involve blank. Okay. Let's carry on, shall we, guys? Into literature. Despite being much longer and more epic in scale, The Lord of the Rings recycles a lot of plot elements from The Hobbit. Both books star a hobbit named Baggins, who gets sent by the wizard Gandalf against their will on a quest to a mountain in a desolate land. After resting in Rivendell and getting crucial advice from Lord Elrond, Baggins and his companions attempt and fail to cross the Misty Mountains due to a storm, so they decide to go through the tunnels under the mountains instead. In the tunnels they fight some orcs slash goblins and lose one of their companions who returns more powerful. Bilbo returns with the ring, Gandalf returns as the white. As they carry on with their journey, they visit a forest kingdom of elves, Mirkwood, slash Lothlorien, encounter giant spiders, the Mirkwood spiders, Shlop, Shelob, and travel on a river. They eventually arrive to a kingdom of humans without a king, Lake Town, slash Gondor, ruled by a corrupt nobleman, the Master, slash Denethor. Next to the desolation where the big bad resides. A descendant of the lost king of the kingdom Bard slash Aragorn participates in deafening, uh, defeating the big bad and reclaims his throne. A battle is fought near the gate of the villain's domain. which is joined by the eagles on the hero side, crops up in some Goosebumps sequel books. In particular, Night of the Living Dummy. The Night of the Living Dummy books all have a female protagonist who has issues with one or more siblings or cousin in three. The Living Dummy, first Mr. Wood, later Slappy, comes to life and does cruel pranks which the protagonist is blamed for. He declares the protagonist to be his slave and then gets defeated with the help of the siblings. Most have a twist where another dummy or doll slash doll is actually alive too. The most wanted book, Son of Slappy, finally mixes things up somewhat by having a male protagonist and the plot about Slappy putting him under mind control Though this does still, though this is still mostly a variant on the protagonist playing for the dummy's pranks idea. Okay, we're going to do one more category. And it's going to be live action TV. Doctor Who, Planet of the Daleks is notoriously a near remake of the first Dalek story, The Daleks. Thals vs Daleks on a planet full of random monsters with the Daleks planning to do something that will make it inhospitable to everyone but them. Revenge of the Cybermen is a near remake of the moon base. Cybermen using a fake plague attack a human outpost somewhere in the solar system intending to use it as a base for an attack on another planet. In the new series, Night Terrors is extremely similar to Fear Her, 
A kid with out-of-control reality warping powers becomes a threat to a working-class contemporary community when their phobias become real. The difference is that in Fear Her, the powers come from an alien that has become emotionally attached to the child, while in Night Terrors, the child is actually an alien himself. Oh, oh. Helix, Season 2 changes the location from the Arctic to an island in the Pacific Northwest, but otherwise is pretty much the same as Season 1. CDC officials have to contend with a viral outbreak at a remote complex with all sort of access points and secrets and led by a mysterious leader who is actually an immortal member of a centuries old conspiracy with at least one member of the CDC team having unofficial ties to the conspiracy over the course of the season the situation deteriorates until the number of infected reaches a critical point and the whole site has to be destroyed. And that is where this episode comes to an end. And I'll tell you that the category that's going to be covered in the next episode or the trope that I'm going to cover in the next episode of this series, will be... The sequel episode. Until then, thanks for watching and goodbye. Hello and welcome to the 33rd official episode of Tropecast. And we are now on to the trope of sequel episodes and I've chosen the category of western animation so to start with the amazing world of Gumball both the burden and the bros act as sequel episodes to the show the latter more so than the former each episode all of which were aired on consecutive weeks forms part of a loose trilogy about Gumball and Penny's relationship and Darwin's feelings towards it. The Nobody deals with Darwin and Gumball finding out someone is living inside their house. Blank. In turn, The Nemesis is a sequel to The Nobody about blank. The Man is about Richard coping with his mother finding a new boyfriend that is his father abandoned him and that his father abandoned him. The signature follows this up as Richard attempts to prevent him getting married prevent them means blank to a minor degree. The check is a sequel to the signature as the episode kicks off when Richard's new stepdad gives his grandkids a gift they start fighting over. The outside follows up the signature being about blank. The pest deals with the very minor fallout from Anias rejecting Billy's friendship in the egg. The awkwardness is a sequel to The Hug, both of which are about the relentlessly awkward meetings between Gumball and someone he doesn't know. The cringe 
follows this further as the two attempt to discover why things between them are always so awkward. In the nest, the monster that's been kidnapping citizens of Elmore turns out to be blank. The Angry Beavers, the episodes Up All Night and Up All Night 2, Up All Day, The Reckoning. The first one concerns the beavers trying to stay up until morning and eventually staying up until the future. In the second one, they get back via a deus ex machine, a uh, machina, m- machina, and decide to go to sleep eventually blank. Also, the muscular beaver episode managed to have four numbered sequels. Arthur, the blizzard season four, features the town pooling their food and coming together to deal with a power out, a power outage. A radio broadcaster makes wildly inaccurate forecasts. Much of this happens again during the blackout season 12, where Dave Reed, remembering how bad the forecasts were. Atomic Puppet does this a fair bit. Atomic Detention ends with Joey and AP, accidentally driving Joey's apathetic sadist teacher, Miss Erlenmeyer, into madness and supervillainy, and she descends a portal into another dimension. It was seemingly forgotten for the next while, until Erlenmeyer's revenge, where Miss Erlen... Erlenmeyer returns to Joey's school, revealing that she has been transformed into a si- into the psychic queen mindbender by a malevolent alien entity. From the dimension she entered, Ticked Off picks up immediately where survival of the Feltist with Joey, his dad, and AP coming back home from their camping trip and Joey finding that a tick from the campsite has embedded into his neck and it becomes sentient when Joey and AP power up. Monster Truck Invasion sees the return of Zorp, the leader of aliens... the, the the leader of alien, the aliens from Pizza Planet. Oh, I wonder where they could have got that from. Then the episode ends with Zorp finding an astronaut chimp, which leads to the plot of Buck Money. Laser Takes Over is a, is a sequel to These Shoes, as it turns out, the malicious AI of the laser hypertops has survived the destruction of its body to continue its scheme to lead machine kind in overthrowing humanity and find itself a new body. Of uh, the Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the episode the day, A Day Unlike Any Other ends with Captain America getting abducted by Skrulls. Prisoner of War later shows how Cap escapes them. Nightmare in Red has the Incredible Hulk get arrested for false pretenses. And the deadliest man, alive, has his teammates try to free him. Okay, Batman the Animated Series had his Silicon Soul. Which was a direct sequel to the two-part Heart of Steel, and Day of the Samurai, which was a sequel to the earlier Night of the Ninja. When the show became the new Batman Avengers, Joker's Millions, followed up on a plot point briefly mentioned, 
in the world's finest crossover with Superman the Animated Series. Bob's Burgers, the season one sexy dance fighting, was about Bob butting heads with Gyro, a handsome capoeira instructor who was stealing Tina's time and attention. In the season 6 episode Sexy Dance Healing, Gyro tries to make amends after Bob injures himself. Bump in the night. It sang from beyond the stars and Comfort Schmumfort are both follow-ups to Not In This Boy's Room as they both featured the return of the alien duo Sleemoth and Gloog and alluded to Mr. Bumpy's first encounter with them. Made in Japan 2 serves as a sequel to the episode Made in Japan and focuses on the return of Little Robot. Buzz Lightyear of Star Command had an episode called Strange Invasion which had Team Lightyear end up on Roswell a planet inhabited by stereotypical green-skinned and large-headed aliens who mistook them for a threat. The episode had a sequel in Stranger Invasion where the heroes returned to Roswell and help and had to help the inhabitants fight back against the invading forces of evil Emperor Zerg. Chalk Zone had a considerable number of episodes that served as continuations to previous episodes. Follow the Bouncing Bag is a sequel to Hole in the Wall, where Vinny Rater where Vinny Ratten continues trying to carry out his scheme of discovering Chalk Zone and exploiting the place and its inhabitants for profit. Disarm Rudy is a continuation of Pumpkin Love, as it has Jacko try to get even with Rudy for stealing his bride. There was a series of episodes devoted to Snap hosting a show where he has a Zona sent out to shoot footage of Chalk Zone wildlife. or snoop on other zoners. The individual episodes were Beanie Boys to Men, where Snap sends Spyfly to observe the training of Scrawl's minions, Wild Chalk Zone, where Snap tries to have push obtain footage of Blecky Bugs, and Journey to the Center of the Yeti, where Snap tried to get Spyfly it, <laughs> to see if there were life forms lurking in the fur of the Yada Yada Yeti from That Thing You Drew. Killer Breath and Doofus Penny's grand opening were both sequels to the Doofy. The former had Doofus Penny try to help Doofus Rudy create the perfect art model by using an invention to merge baby's breath with the killer bush in hopes of creating a baby bush that will stay still only to play Chalk Zone with a terror aptly named Killer Breath. The latter had Doofus Penny drag Snap into a tour of her Scientastical Hall of One Doors. <laughs> One Doors! Reggie the Red had the episode's main conflict resolve around Reggie Bullnerd finding a piece of red chalk that nearly took over Rudy in Battle of the Hands. The further Avengers of, Super Sna of Superhero Snap serves as a sequel to Superhero Snap and has Snap help generic man generic man recapture the villain Major Brand Major Brand <laughs> what lame names after she escapes from the secure yet humane 
correctional facility generic man took her to. Snap vs. Boo Rats is a continuation of both Benny Ratton's episodes and Indecent Exposure, as it has Benny Ratton and Terry Buffon working together after discovering that they're both obsessed with exposing the existence of Chalk Zone. Codename Kid Next Door had plenty over its run. They may well have been story arcs. Operation Caked, which were all named with a number at the end, have six SIX dealt with the KND confronting the delightful children and trying to take their birthday cake away from them, blank. Likewise, the final episode, Operation Interviews, was centred around this. Operation Cable TV led into Operation End, Operation Jewels, Operation Rabbit, Operation Chocolate, and Operation Licorice, and Operation Caramel, detailed the story around number five, and her arch rival Heinrich, Operation End, Operation Training, and Operation Graduates, which focused on number two's brother Tommy training to be a KND agent, Operation President, and Operation Snowing, set up Operation Elections, detailing the fiasco of the school president and the consequences that there followed occurs twice in Defenders of the Earth in A House Divided Ming turns a phantom's estranged brother Kurt who believes he is the rifle phantom into Ndama the weather demon and lures the phantom and Jeddah into a confrontation with him. Kurt and Dharma reappears in Family Reunion where he is still out for revenge. His lust for his lust for power ultimately proves to be his undoing as he is killed off for real. In the evil of Dr. Dark, Ming turns to the evil magician Dr. Damien Dark a former Shadow Lord and an old enemy of Mandrake to seek the three pieces of the orb of Konos which has the power to grant immortality. The episode sequel, The Return of Dr. Dark sees the defenders along with their friend Mara Ming's forces and Dark racing to find the pieces of the orb in the end, Dark, like Kurt, slash Endama, is destroyed as a result of his own greed. The Family Guy episode, Internal Affairs, is a continuation of Foreign Affairs. Both go into Joe and Bonnie's deteriorating relationship. Futurama. In the episode, the cryonic room woman is essentially a sequel to the pilot episode, showing how far Fry has come, reminding us of what his life was like before he was frozen, and showing how someone might suffer for being a fish out of water in this situation. They even pointed this out in the DVD commentary. During the episode, Parasites Lost... Among the many changes to himself via a beneficial worm infestation in his body, Fry gains the ability to play the Holophona. It is said that not many people in the whole universe can play it, and the few that could can't play it well, cementing his relationship with Leela. However, to find out whether or not she loves the real him, he induces a Pygmalion snapback. By driving the worms out of his body, he tries playing the Holophona again, and as expected, 
he lost both his talent and his seduction over Leela. The episode ends with Fry practicing on the Holofana. But he but this is not revisited until the Devil's Hands are idle playthings. A series finale, centering on Fry's ability to play the Holofana. Jeez. Gravity Falls Season 1 had the Time Traveller's Pig, in which Mabel and Dipper steal a Time Traveller's Time Machine, so that they can win a pig and impress Wendy at the same time. Each time they try only one succeeds. Inadvertently getting the Time Traveller Blendin fired for losing his Time Machine and a couple of kids, that to a couple of kids. Season 2 has Blendin's game, where a disgraced Blendin challenges the twins to a game of Globner to win his freedom and a time wish in revenge. The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, episode Skeletons in the Water Closet, ends with Billy's mum going crazy because of Grim. Grim vs. Mum has her coming back to settle the score. And then there's the Nigel Planter episodes and the Secret Snake Club episodes. Hi Hi Puffy Amy Yumi had at least three episodes that served as continuations of previous episodes. Hired Help is a continuation of The Oddy Guard and has Amy and Yumi try to help their former bodyguard Wall find a new line of work. BC Road Trip visits the prehistoric incarnations of Amy, Yumi and Kaz, seen in Puffy BC, and focuses on Cape Man Kaz, trying to find a way to make it easier to carry around the band's instruments. Manga Madness was given a sequel episode called Manga Madness Part 2, which had Amy and Yumi help their manga heroes, Noble Knight and Decibel Destroyer, fight their arch enemy, Mr. Master. AKA the lamest name for a villain ever. The Incredible Hulk has Helping Hand, Iron Fist, which served to this. For the Iron Man episode, Hulkbuster, with Tony and Bruce already knowing each other, including both acting as secret keeper, as a secret keeper, for the other's ad- secret identity. Tony tries to help Bruce cure himself of the Hulk, and Tony and Rhodey sporting tweet versions of their season 2 designs. Kim Possible, the second season episode Return of the Wanna Wanna Weep is a sequel to the first season episode Sink or Swim, in which Gil, or Jill, a mutated former camper buddy of Ron's, wreaks havoc. In the sequel episode Wanna Weep, has been reopened and Jill has returned to his human Gil has returned to his human form. In the fourth season, Oh No Yono follows up on the introduction of Hannah, Ron's adopted baby sister, in Big Brother, with plot lines set up in the Big Brother coming to fruition in Oh No Yono. The events of the grand finale graduation are triggered by blank. In Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, the episode Goofy Babysitter is a follow-up of Goofy Baby, except instead of Goofy getting turned into a baby, 
Mickey and the rest of his friends end up transformed. The My Life as a Teenage Robot episode, Raggedy Android, <laughs> get it? Is about Dr. Wakeman making a suit that could disguise Jenny as a human, but doing such a rush job that people were far more scared of it than Jenny. Return of Raggedy Android centered on a newer version of the exosuit that actually worked and far too well. The latter had a sequel hook for an, another possible sequel episode. The exosuit was still alive and took Mr. Mesmer as a new host, which was never resolved on screen, but Mr. Mesmer was later shown to be fine, implying that it was dealt with off screen. Phineas and Ferb, the tag, for the Chronicles of Meep consisted of an episode trailer for Meepless in Seattle, which the creators had no intention of making. Yes, no intention, not not intention. Unfortunately for them, the idea of revisiting Meep and Mitch got so popular that it led to the production of Meepless in Seattle. Likewise, Meepless also ended with a fake trailer in the tag, this time with the narrator expressly declaring that they have no intentions to put these snippets together for a future episode. Meepless in Seattle also expands on the B-plot of Is About Time, which saw Doofenshmirtz fighting a new nemesis. Perry and Peter's relationship is expanded further in Lost in Danville, in which Doofenshmirtz meets Professor Mystery, the other evil scientist. Tales from the Residence, Back to the Second Dimension, is set two months after the made for TV movie and follows the lives of the Second Dimension characters since Doof 2's defeat. It especially follows up on a deleted scene that introduced Vanessa to and her impaired teenage social life as her father banishes any guy who tries to ask her out. <laughs> the Pound Puppies, 1980s episode, Where Do Puppies Come From? which had the Pound Puppies help out a dog named Rusty and his pregnant mate Lucy which is given a sequel episode, Pops on the Loose, which have Rusty and Lucy entrust the Pound Puppies with looking after their new children. The Powerpuff Girls, Supper Villain. is an episode about a neighbour of the Powerpuff Girls who decides to become a supervillain when they visit his house. Just Desserts sees his family joining him. Monkey See Doggy 2 is about Mojo Jojo trying to redo his plan from Monkey See Doggy Do. More successfully, Aspiration saw Seducer trying to do trying to restore her power after having her prehensile hair cut and end off at the end of something at uh, something AMs ready jet go asteroid belt space race is a sequel to space race as it focuses on the rematch that celery and Zucchini promised to have at the end of the latter episode, this time with Eggplant and Zerk involved. Racing on Sunshine is a sequel to Kick Cart Derby, which takes place one year after said episode. Lone Star 2, Rocket Kids, is a sequel to Lone Star, hence this title, Recess, The Big Prank, is about TJ attempting to pull a prank on King Bob, 
so he can officially earn the latter's former title of Prankster Prince. The madness of King Bob. Bob has Bob jealous of TJ getting more admiration for his pranks than he did when he held the title. Abandon his post so he can pull a prank on TJ. Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon has Fire Dogs 2, which is a sequel to Fire Dogs an episode of the original series. Though it has little to do with it apart from it starting where the original episode ended. Rick and Morty, spoiler warning here. The season 3 episode The Rick Lantis Mix-Up serves as a direct sequel to the season 3 premiere The Rick Shank Redemption. In the latter episode, Rick broke out of prison, and in the process, pitted his two greatest enemies, the Galactic Federation and Citadel of Ricks, against each other, with both sides suffering heavy casualties and massive damage. The former episode then shows how the Citadel and the Ricks and Mortys living there have been repairing and recovering from the damage and what life has been like for them since. Rick Lantis Mix-Up also serves as more of an indirect sequel to Season 1's Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind in that blank. The Simpsons Viva Ne Flanders Homer and Ned get married to two floozies while drunk in Las Vegas. The episode ends with Homer and Ned leaving town and their second wives behind. Three seasons later in Brawl in the Family, the two women reappear, having tracked them to Springfield. Oh Brother Where Art Thou shows Homer meeting his successful long-lost half-brother Herb and ends with Homer ruining his brother's career and their relationship. Brother Can You Spare Two Dimes shows a down-on-his-luck herb returning, regaining his fortune with the Simpsons' help, and reconciling with Homer. Special Edna was continued in My Big Fat Geek Wedding. Season 28, Camp Crustier, which is a sequel to Season 4's Camp Krusty, You Don't Have to Live Like a Referee follows up on two episodes at once, Blame It on Lisa, where the Simpsons go to Brazil to find a missing orphan that Lisa sponsored, and Marge Gamer, where Homer becomes a referee for Lisa's soccer game, South Park. In the first episode titled Cartman Gets an Anal Probe, Alien Visitors Probe Cartman This wasn't brought up again aside from a clip show parody episode until the 100th episode cancelled. Season 13's The Coon in which Cartman adopts a superhero identity a la Batman and encounters his arch rival Mysterion is revisited near the end of the 14th season where Cartman back as The Coon has gathered up the South Park kids in a superhero team reminiscent of the of Justice League or Watchmen and the story proceeds to involve the gang dealing with BP now renamed DP Reckless Spilling that inadvertently unleashes Cthulhu and his minions upon the earth in a massive three episode story arc don't ask right before the 14th season finale. 200 and 201, while being a milestone celebration, were likewise sequel episodes to Scott Tenerman Must Die and The Cartman's Mum is a Dirty Slut two-parter. Steven Universe is normally a continuity-heavy series where things that change in one episode are regularly called back to in another, and some episodes plus are directly derived from earlier ones. Stevens Lion, Lion 2 the movie, 
and Lion 3 straight to video don't actually have much to do with each other as far as their individual plots were concerned, aside from Lion having a major role in each. Lion 2 and Lion 3 receive an actual follow-up in Rose's Scubbard, which revisits certain elements of the previous episodes, in particular Rose's armory and her cool, swir- cool sword. Lion 4 alternate ending follows up on Lion 3 in a different way, as Stephen reassesses the message from his mother to find some hidden purpose. House Guest, the first episode of the first season's second half, deals with one of the immediate consequences of Mirror Gem and Ocean slash Ocean Gem, the half season finale, Greg's broken leg, an injury he suffered in Ocean Gem. Open Book is one to Rose's room. Both are set in the eponymous room, and both have a similar plot where Stephen has to deal with the room's strange effects. The test kicks off when Stephen discovers that the ceasefire mission from Cheeseburger Backpack was a test, which he thinks he failed. The first episode of Season 2, full disclosure, picks up directly from the ending of season, the season 1 finale, The Return and Jailbreak. As Stephen tries to escape, uh, tries to cope in the aftermath of the latter, We Need to Talk is a direct follow-up of Story for Stephen. Both whole episode flashbacks centred on Greg and Rose. Greg the Babysitter is a third set later still, though the focus is a bit more on Greg specifically. Coach Stephen centers on gun and amethyst fusing, inspiring anxiety, and a song from Pearl until their fusion goes out of control and Pearl has to stop her, cry for help, Starts with Garnet deciding to fuse with Pearl instead of Amethyst for a similar task, causing Amethyst to experience similar feelings and also a song. Super Watermelon Island is not only a sequel to Watermelon Stephen, it is also part of the resolution of two separate story arcs. Escapism returns to Watermelon Stephen's Island, but is more of a backdrop as Stephen is there for incidental reasons. And if Yeah, I think that'll go into uh episodes I haven't seen yet, so I need to stop reading now. Tasmania had Here Kitty 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 and its follow-up Here Kitty 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 Part 2, which saw an evil house cat owned by Taz's sister, Molly, try to kill Taz, and every single time Molly saw the two, the cat would pretend to be the victim. Like they do. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1987 had a couple. One was Mr. Nice Guy, which was a sequel to the episode Leonardo Lightens Up. As both plots involve one of the turtles being affected by Donatello's personality ray, Michelangelo beat Meets Bugman had a sequel that was naturally called Michelangelo Meets Bugman Again. Avengers in Turtle Sitting was a spiritual sequel to Back to the Egg, as both had the same of the turtle, as some of the turtles reduced to five years old, which left the ones who kept their natural age to look after them, notably Leonardo was turned into a five-year-old in both. Menace Maestro Please was a sequel to Name That Tune, 
and is notable for immediately following the previous episode, unlike most cases. Jeez, I didn't take into account how many there would be. Okay guys, we'll uh, call it here for this episode. And I'll ask you to join me for the next episode in which I will be going over the trope of what I'm gonna call Okay, not what I'm going to call, because it's going to be the sequel hook. And... I'm going to use the category here of... web original until then goodbye